are the Orgs, and, and we, we have, have a plan. plan. To watch all of Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica. And drink beer. Hello friend and welcome to Forecast Galactica 6.13. 13! 13! 13! 13! Now you got it! Damn it! Hello. 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 Yes, we're covering Blood and Chrome, folks. It's our last bit of Battlestar coverage. We all became responsible the day we created the Cylons. We let them into our lives only to see them repay our trust with a violent revolt against us. In a war where mankind's very survival hangs in the balance, kill the enemy or be killed. Ensign William Adama reporting for flight duty, sir. They're taking down our planes right and left. I can't get a lock. Incoming! Brace for contact. The fate of this war hinges on the success of this mission. Fire! This is uh, something that started out as a 2012 webisode series in 10 parts, and Ooh. it kind of shows, because it, it kind of there's a cliffhanger every 10 minutes. Yeah, there, there is actually, yeah. Artificial. It's designed as a prequel to Galactica and a sequel to Caprica. Wow. And if it had done well, it was scheduled to lead into a new series. Mm. This did not happen. No, I wonder why. Uh, David Icke was involved, along with some of the other Battlestar Galactica personnel, but not Ronald E. Moore, who was signed with Sony and therefore wasn't available. OK. But maybe also he was like, I've done it now. Yeah, I kind of... I expect that may have been in his thinking, yeah. Yeah. So, it opens with a Dear Dad letter. Mm-hmm. And this is young Bill Adama looking 12, or at least played by a 12-year-old anyway. Mm. And he's writing to his dad, and he's very sort of anti-Cylon, kill the enemy or be killed. You get to see some old-style raiders, which is cool. And he's out fighting, and he's shot, and he can't see, so he blows his hatch off, and there's like a radiation countdown, but he gets really close and fires his actual hand weapon, and as a result, blows the other ship up, and then it's, hooray, he was in a simulation, and he is the best of the best of the best, sir, apparently. Yeah. And then you have the the old theme music playing, while um, he's then going to start on the Galactica. We get to see it when it was new, but there appear to be more gubbins on it than I remember. Yeah, it's covered in armour plating and a lot more gun turrets as well. Yeah, it's not a good look, to be honest. But there we are. This is Luke Pasquialano, as opposed to Nico Cortez, who played the young Adama in Razor. See, the young Adama in Razor didn't look 12. No. Well, this guy looks too young. He does. Doesn't uh, mean he is, but that's how he looks. Yeah. If you remember that, the the other guy, Nico Cortez, he, he seemed to be trying too hard to do a Olmos impression mm. and it didn't really work. Whereas this, this guy's at least just playing it naturally, I guess, but it does mean then that it doesn't feel like the Dharma particularly. So. No, it doesn't at all. And there's a later scene that I find really icky as a result of how young he looks. Mm. So anyway, he arrives and he's like, oh, do you want to find your billet? And he's like, no, I want to get in a plane because I am the best of the best, sir. And so... Th- uh, he's told that he's going to be driving a Raptor, which he uh, says is akin to driving a bus. You notice all the, the sets aren't real. It's they all, don't look real. No, it's all I'm CG afraid. and lens flare and out of focus and unreal. And yeah, this is. Had they made this now when they got, you know, the amazing effects you see on Mandalorian with that wall of stuff that they use to, to, to basically put the scenery on the background that it looks seamless, then it probably looked a lot better. But. The effects they had back in the day, not so good. Yeah. And I think as well that back in the day, what CG could do well and still does do well is augment something that exists. But mm. it wasn't that good back then at creating something entirely. No. Is it? I couldn't tell you why it doesn't look real. I can just tell you that it doesn't. It. Yeah, it's... It's all soft focus and, and doesn't feel solid as a result. And I think it's soft focus because they haven't got the, the definition in the, oh, okay. the graphics. That's the Fair problem. Enough. The later scenes, I thought, on the snow planet were a lot better. But, yes, they were. Uh, that was very cleverly done. But, yeah, the inside of Galactica, not so much. No. And then you have them all reporting for missions and the Playmobil is back from the original Battle. Yes, Star. except it's not a little cart this time. It's um... Yeah, I still like the concept, though. <laughs> They're still rattling around. 
But anyway, it turns out that their their cargo is a woman who is a software engineer, and he meets Coca, who's known as Coca because no one can pronounce his Polish surname. Well, it's not Polish, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was. It looked Polish to me. Yeah, this is Battlestar Galactica. Oh, sorry, Poland. Po- po- <laughs> po- Poland. Rather than Polish, no, it'll be then. it'll be Piscean or something. Yeah, oh, okay, taking um, the Pisces. Yeah, um, <laughs> whatever. He's the hand solo of this operation yeah. in a big way. He actually refers to the the female character on point as her highness. It's like, really, could you yeah. try any harder to make him hand solo? Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's not attractive enough, as far as I'm concerned. And anyway, they've got they've got this mission, and they go out, and oh, and the guy. Commander Baldy, I didn't catch. His Commander name. Nash, right. do you recognise him? Yes, but I couldn't tell you where from. We've got to play. Who are you? Brian Markinson, who was uh, he was in Caprica, but you won't be recognising him from that. But he's also uh, Doctor Elias Geiger in Deep Space Nine's In the Cards. He was the dude that had the atom exciter machine for prolonging yes, your life. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> Jake and Nog had to deal with him. Yeah. Well, okay. Yep, yeah, that's where I know him from. Fair enough. And he's like, oh, are you really the best pilot and whatever? And he's like, yes. And then they're sent on a so-called milk run, except once they're out of trade of contact with the Battlestar, the woman who is their cargo, the software engineer, says, um, right, you've got new orders and opens them up and they've got to go somewhere completely different. And so it's no longer a milk run. It's actually quite scary because they're going on the edge of Cylon space. And it turns out she worked on Cylon brains. Which, again, is sort of tying into Caprica. Okay. Um, So they're... They're hailing the the archer on, but then they get hit by a body that's been spaced, which is quite dramatic, and the ship's been destroyed. And she goes, oh, do you think that was the archer on while they're underneath the scene that says archer on in fuck off massive letters? Yeah, Yeah, it's unfortunate timing. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you notice it's a slightly different raptor design as well. Kind of like got a spoiler on the back. It it did look a bit different, but I couldn't tell you why. And it had a tail gun thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like the fact that it's, it's because it's earlier on, the Raptors don't come with jumps drive, so that's at least something that's sensible. There's been an ambush, they've got a load of enemy contacts, so you then get a chase that... It could just be me, because I find it difficult to... I have issues with depth perception, so I have difficulty processing things, anything moving at high speed. So it could be that other people could follow it and it was just me, but I could not work out what was going on, it... other than bang, bang, shooty. It's basically it was it got very computer gamey and you got complete with chompers at one point as well, yeah, it's, it's all right but it's not great. Anyway, as as a result, sort of hooray, they've done it, woohoo, and then they pick up a message, and now they've got new coordinates to go to inside on space, and they argue over going because Coco doesn't want to go. But when they get there, there's a colonial transponder, except weapons lock on them and they want to know the password. And it turns out the password is Arrow. Quite why she, she leaves it that late to tell them. That's uh, incredibly stupid. I know it's all need to know stuff, but, you know, she's actually they risked... they ask the first password the first time, they Exactly. She's risked her own life and the, 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 the mission that she's so dedicated to by not telling them a little bit earlier. Yeah, ridiculous. Mm. Anyway, and then they see the, the Valkyrie, which, of course, we've got mentioned in that previous thing, didn't it, with Bulldog? Yes, that's right. That's where it was from, wasn't it? Yes. And then you meet Captain Kelly, but it isn't. Yeah, it's Ty Olsen playing a different character who seems to be like sort of kind of the XO-ish. Seems to be doing an awful lot on that ship, to be honest. So you've then got a sort of, it's all sort of what's going to happen. And it's, I just wrote, oh no, the person we know is alive years later is in jeopardy. I just struggle with this. Yeah, that it is a fatal flaw in all. But you know, it's prequelitis. If it's got a character in that you know from later on, then you know that character is completely safe. Yeah. So it's just stupid. Yeah. yeah, and then you have Coco meeting up with a an old friend who's called call sign appears to be Sunshine. Yeah, it's Jim Kirby, who's played by Sebastian Spence, who was Nacho from the Pegasus and BSG. I mean, all, nearly all these actors get yeah. recycled. The commander of this particular ship is. Uh, Played by Jill Teed, who was Sergeant Hadrian. Back yeah, at the, the start yeah. of BSG. <sighs> anyway, yeah. he ends up telling Sunshine that he has a son, and he's sort of really happy. So then you have yet another mission, and and Bill is all, "Well, take me, take me, please, sir, please, sir," kind of thing. 
And initially it's going to be like, no, we're going to go with someone we know, even if you say you're good. And then I've written, never written down the scientist's name. Was it Re- Rebecca or Becca? Kelly, she was, I think Rebecca, yeah, she was Becca Kelly. I think. Yeah. So. Anyway, she says that these guys have got her this far. They need to get, you know, she would rather stay with them. So it's like, okay. So then you have the Osiris jumping, and it's got these strange wonky bits on the bottom that apparently make it in stealth mode. Well, I don't know. That's just me just guesswork that it's something to do with its bizarre stealth system. But yes, it does have like sort of antennae bits hanging down from the bottom. I do quite like the look of the Osiris. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. And again, it's all armor plated up as well, mm. like the, this version of the Galactica. But it's getting. Shot to ship because there is a base star there. It's going to fire the nukes, but they won't actually fire, so it ends up going on a suicide mission. But although, on the one hand, you think, oh, it's sad they're going on a suicide mission, they are so outgunned, they're dying anyway. Yes, yeah, so you may as well take so them out. So you may as yeah. well take out as many as you can at the same at the same time. They so do try and make you care about these characters that literally you met a few minutes ago. Obviously, she's got some sort of close relationship with not Captain Kelly. But, yeah, it's it's, it's a bit of a few, you know, it's on the highway to nothing because we have just literally yeah. met them, so. Yeah. And then you have a couple of Vipers escorting the Raptor down to the planet, which is where the, the rendezvous is, and you end up with Sunshine. So the, the, the other guy goes first, and I didn't catch his name. No, well, he's a few seconds on screen, so yeah. I not And then that. Sunshine buys it as well. Uh, but they they have taken out some raiders on the way, including um, Coca taking one out with the tail gun. So the way that Bill gets around it is he dumps fuel and then sets fire to it in order to blow up the raiding raider. But he, they then crash and they land in the snow, but sort of on a precipice. Thankfully, mm-hmm. not quite as bad as um, Italian job. <laughs> this is the self-preservation society. This is the self-preservation society. But yeah, it was a sort of nearly over the edge and dead. It's it's a, literally a cliffhanger. Oh, yes. well done. <laughs> At least they're not hanging over with their umbrellas. Yes. Isn't Cliffhanger a movie with Sylvester Stallone? It is, it? yes. It's not a very good one. Anyway, there's more tiresome quarrelling between Adama and Coca. They move on to try and rendezvous with the commandos, but they find that they're frozen and dead. Um, Again, really cool snow shots for this. Mm. Coker is bitten by a gribbly, which turns out to be an Ely thing. That's a Cylon test product for organic life. It's sort of like a fuck-off massive snake, isn't it? Mm, Yeah, so it's half snake, half eel, yes. Well, eels live in water, and this wasn't in the water. No, but it looked like an eel to me, more like it did a snake, anyway. Then they're rescued by Tech Sergeant Chen. I mean, Tech Sergeant (laughs) Toff. Was played by John Piper, who was the uh, cap- a captain from the Pegasus and was one of the Hollander brothers in A Fistful of Daters. He's also in Unforgiven, Agents of Shed. And uh, his first ever TV role was in The Littlest Hobo. There's a voice that keeps on calling me Down the road, that's where I'll always be In this, he's a crazy man and turns on Coker at one point. They take shelter in a ski lodge that he's been using as a base. We have a very dull scene with Kelly and Adama talking about her husband who was killed by friendly fire, which leads them to getting it on, naturally. Oh, and this is the scene I found really uncomfortable because he fucking looks 12. (laughs) It's just like, no, he's too young. A, you should not be attracted to him. B, if you are, just no. I didn't know how much it was turning out to be her manipulating him, but anyway. hmm. Mm, Yeah, but still, no. They come under attack with some very chunky Terminator-looking Cylons. They did look Terminator-like! Yeah, they start hunting Kelly because they're apparently going for a horror vibe now, underlined by her finding body parts, which is all very Razor, and I think it was more effectively done in Razor, to be honest. Adama takes one out with a stick, which is rather less than impressive. Another is about to attack Kelly, but stops when it scans her dog tag. Coco finally cracks and holds Adama and Kelly at gunpoint and demands she tells them everything, and she says that they're on a last-chance mission to save humanity by uploading a virus into the Cylon defences via an array on the planet. 
They go to the transmission station, which is very Borg-like, to be honest. Yes. They, sh- they should have stuck with red for Cylon Tech, because yeah. green is, it just makes you think Borg. Just as Kelly seems to be uploading the data, Coca shoots her for being a spy, since the Cylon didn't kill her earlier. Kelly shoots them both. Apparently she wants to negotiate with the Cylons. Motivation seems to come out of nowhere, to be honest. She's run out of bullets, though, and Adama shoots the consoles, apparently miraculously having been recovered from being shot. Adama takes Coca with him, dripping blood, and they set up a distress beacon. Coca, I thought, corked it initially. I thought. As he gives Adama a picture of his wife with a cliched, You're all right, Husker! Oh, man. Adama is rescued, because of course he is, because he's got to live to be in the next series. And the thing is, I'm watching this going, I know he's got to be rescued because of the next series, but nobody knows where they are, so where's this help coming from? Yeah, I don't know. They suddenly had that stick that he lit up and they could be rescued, whereas before they, it looked like they weren't going to get rescued. So, yeah, that didn't really work either. No. Back at the lodge, a weird, badly CGI'd Proto 6, voiced by Trisha Heffer, asks Kelly if she's alive, which obviously ties into the original series before killing her. Yeah, it's a very bad effect. It's like something from a cartoon, to be honest. Yeah, it's also... Like one of those Transformers cartoons that came out a few years back. But, yeah. Actually, it made me think of Cats, because the face was kind of floating. To be honest, it wasn't as good as Cats. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! <Yeah>. Meow! <laughs> <laughs> Back on the Galactica, Commander Nash demands that uh, Dharma reports that, that all went to plan for a public morale. And there's some guff about it actually all going... Ac- it was apparently the original plan was to give him disinformation or something but that's not terribly clear to be honest and it's such a convoluted plan if that's the truth but anyway as a reward Adama gets a viper turns out a promotion because he starts as an ensign and at the end he's a lieutenant oh right I hadn't noticed that turns out Coker did actually make it I mean I was kind of thought like he was appearing in a sort of dream sequence but no he is alive wow I'm not that bothered to be honest there's another crappy voiceover letter to his dad as Adama gets into his viper complete with Husker call sign, because we really were desperate to find out the origin of that. And what does it even mean? Yeah, I know Coca calls it in, but what, what does it mean? Does Husker mean something in United States? I've, 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 I, don't, I always thought Perhaps it I was... need to Google Husker. Maybe know. you do, but I always assumed it's because he had a Husky voice, because Olmos does. Yeah, but this guy doesn't, does he? No. And, and why would he... Even if he did, why would... Oh, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. Hang on, let's... To Google... <laughs> I know mean, Husker Du, that's the name of a band, isn't it? Right. Apparently it refers to a Nebraska resident. Well, that's not going to work, is it? No. Uh... Student of the University of Nebraska. But again, that makes no sense. There is no Nebraska in BSG. Hmm. No, it's, uh, if somebody can explain that one to us, we would appreciate it. It doesn't make any Apparently sense. Apparently it comes from the Danish... And again, that makes no sense. It might come from a board game, which doesn't make no, again, it sense either. Yeah, and the whole thing ends with some naff guitar music, to be honest. Not Beck McCready's greatest work. There well, were some nice spaceships in it, though. There was. At least we got some spaceship scenes, yes. I mean, as you commented, it, it's an improvement on the plan. There's yeah. a lot more that happens. We see some spaceships. The, the major weakness of it is that there's no tension because you know that Adama's going to make it through to the end. So, And it's a bit like the Skywalkers in Star Wars. Why does everything in BSG yeah. have to do a bit yeah. Adama? Because the Caprica is about Adama as well, yeah. or his, his father. Yeah. it's For <clears throat> me, if you wanted to have a prequel and you wanted to involve Adama, which makes sense because Adama's older, mm. that a prequel would would involve him it should be a bit like with the flashbacks you got with razor and that it should be a secret he's keeping do you know what i mean or yeah. something like that so there's no jeopardy because you can't get jeopardy no and didn't razor point out that pretty much as soon as he got in a ship for the first time and got in a battle that was it the war was over yeah so where was this series going to go to because you know well no the art they too, were arguing too that it, they were arguing that it's black ops and therefore it wouldn't be on the record no, because I'm sure in Razor they, it was his first mission in a Viper. I mean, basically this ends as as Razor just, begins. Oh, so okay. where are you going to squeeze a series into that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, and he needed a more likable character as well. It, it, needed uh, it doesn't seem pay- like Adama because he's such a knob. I mean, and, I suppose people do change over time, but I'm not interested in finding out about Adama when he was a knob personally. No, and it needed to not be played by a 12-year-old. <sighs> Squeaky voice team. Hey! 
Mr. Wembley, it happened again. And, you know, actually, in a way, I think if I was going to choose a prequel, if there had to be one, if somebody felt that they wanted the backstory exploring more, I'd like to see Ties. Yeah. Because we've seen yeah. Bill Adama's in Razor. If you were going to see anybody's, again, it needs to be an older character, doesn't it? Yeah, but Ty turned out to be one of the final five, so that's a bit of a non-event in some ways, isn't it? I mean, the, unfortunately, they, they shot their world way too early because, like, a few minutes in, there's that awesome picture of, oh, and then the Cylons turned on us and rebelled with a huge, great big tank thing and all these Cylons. You think, ooh, this is going to be good. Nah, you don't yeah. get to see that. Uh, that would have obviously been too expensive to have done or something. But that's the series it should have been. It's yeah. like the Silent Revolt, not involving Adama or anybody we know, because then there'd be some risk and jeopardy. Yeah, that new I could, characters. Yeah, that w- I would have definitely got into. But as it is, yeah. I mean, you could have done a series of the effect on the civilians, couldn't you? Mm. The other problem, the, another problem is that the, the Cylons in here are very two-dimensional bad guys. There's none of the subtlety of the Cylons mm. that sometimes seem actually more human and and caring than the humans do now and in this they're just the bad guys they're the stormtroopers that we have to fight with six turning up at the end looking all monsterish and naff yeah so it's a bit hollow in comparison to better saga galactica yeah turns out they did need ronald d moore after all <laughs> yeah but also they needed time to potentially develop characters, except this is a prequel, so that doesn't... I think a prequel can work with new characters. So Star Wars Rebels that we're enjoying at the moment... Oh, yeah. Well, again, that, yes, but the reason that works is it isn't about Skywalkers. No, it's completely new characters yeah. that you can then invest in, and that's what they should have done with perhaps some... They've got a link with Ahsoka. They've got... Do you know what I mean? There mm. were links there, so you could have had Adama as a link... But not focus on him. And if you had new characters, then that could be interesting and there could be jeopardy. Mm. But there isn't, is there? No. No. No jeopardy to be had. No. Jeopardy free. <laughs> 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 I don't know why that made me laugh, but it did. Oh, well, never mind. What did Sam Poe and Yona make of this? Like me, did they prefer it to the plan? Well, funnily enough, how do they start? Let's start off by saying this was a lot better than the plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. This was at least a coherent story that you could enjoy without having seen the series. That being said, it was almost painfully standard plot with seemingly mm. all the possible tropes thrown in. The Crankery veteran with X days left to retirement, yes. paired up with the idealist hotshot rookie, mandatory sex scene followed by the inevitable betrayal, main characters with plot armour while everyone else dies. But I don't want to sound too negative. It was fun seeing the Galactica all shiny, though the sets were a bit too obviously CG. <laughs> but I understand you don't want to build the sets for a one-off TV movie. The space battles were fun, and I liked the new ship design of the Osiris. The Centurion models also looked cool, although the CG was again a bit ropey sometimes. The scenes in the ski resort with the Centurions reminded Yona of a bit, a bit of Jurassic Park. To summarise, it was an enjoyable watch, but entirely forgettable, as evidenced by the length of the feedback. But there is another reason for the short feedback, in addition to the lack of things to analyse in this movie. Since this is the end of our little Battlestar Galactica journey, we would like to end by thanking you for a lovely podcast. I've been listening to you since you cover Best of Both Worlds, but you're not only got to know you through the Galactica rewatch, I'll let her write something. Thank you for your podcast. For me, this was a different way to experience a sci-fi TV series and has deepened my thoughts about Galactica. You guys have given me many new perspectives. And what a journey we have had with babies having been born, all the quarantines and the beers being drunk. I'll drink to that. Oh, gosh, now there's a word in... Finnish? Finnish? Oh, with apologies to en- to everybody we know who <laughs> speaks Finnish. Poor... Poyan man kuata. Cheers. And no. I probably got that totally and utterly wrong, and I apologise. Kitos. Which is about the only finish I know. What does that mean? Thank you. <laughs> oh, fine, OK. I always make it a point if I go to a country to learn at least the word for thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. So that's it, I guess. We've never seen Buck Rogers, and I suspect for good reason. But Yona will miss you guys if we stop, and I'll never get her to watch Star Trek, so I guess I'll have to acquire the episodes from somewhere. Mm. P.S. Yona wanted me to clarify that we haven't actually had any new babies yeah. during this podcast, and she was referring to the wonder. Llama God's baby. Yes. <laughs> also, she probably meant babies having been born. She apologises. She's having a bit of a non-corona flu for the last few days. Oh, no, it's probably feeling oh, better. Yeah, get well soon. Yeah, if you can acquire Buck Rogers, it's silly fun. It's cheesy, very, very cheesy. Yes. Um, but it, it, it's going to, yes, we, I think we'll have more to laugh about in Buck yeah. Rogers than we did in Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. 
Something of an understatement, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> OK, over to the MP3. And we've heard from Andrew. Usually I have a good idea of how I'm going to start these things. I don't have a good idea of how I'm going to start this one. So I'm going to use the fact that I don't have a good idea of how to start this one as the way of starting this one. I do remember seeing this when it was first around on YouTube many years ago. And I wasn't overwhelmed by it. I wasn't overwhelmed by it this time either. And I just don't have a lot for this, I'm afraid. I didn't think the story was very interesting. I didn't think the plot was very involving. I think by the end, the necklace having a virus on it, but it's not a virus, it's the location of a fleet. But that's okay because the fleet was somewhere else. That was just muddy, really. I didn't think the characters were really all that interesting. Adama didn't seem much like Adama at all. I think the Adama who was in the flashbacks in Razor was a better match for the older Adama, just physically, demeanor-wise. And I don't think they had Adama's voice, not vocal voice, but his writing dialogue voice. Even taking into account this is a younger version, I, it didn't sound like the character of William Adama. There were glimpses of things. Glimpses of the Cylon War, where you had tanks going through the streets and base stars hovering over cities in the way that bricks don't. Adama turns out to be a Viper pilot in the same mold as Starbuck, that kind of out-of-the-box thinking, risk-taking pilot who knows just how good they are. Possibly that's why they got on, to begin with. And then there's Galactica herself, in her prime, in her heyday, covered in guns, big expansive CGI sets inside. And it is a nice moment when Adama sees Galactica for the first time. It's really nice gelling of the old Battlestar Galactica music with the new Battlestar Galactica music. And God's Dam is exactly the correct thing to say upon seeing Galactica for the first time. But we never get to see a fight though. We never get to see a fight. We've got all those guns, all those vipers, and she doesn't get into a single space battle. She's in her prime, but we don't get to see her in her prime doing the thing she was built for, turning Cylon base stars into scrap. What a note upon which to end my feedback to Ronald D. Moore's Battlestar Galactica. Was Ronald D. Moore involved in this at all? Let me check. No. Okay. Well, maybe that explains it. So, yeah, I genuinely don't think I have much else to say about that, so I'll probably end it there. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for listening to all my feedback. It's been fun. I think we've, we've done well. I think we've got something good here with this. I think we've got a, you know, a document in this podcast that'll stand the test of time. So, well done everyone. Golf clap. Golf clap. Thank you for your kind attention. Best of luck in all your future endeavours. Take care, and bye for now. Thank you, bye. Thank you. I think that was the Battlestar Galactica theme. The really surreal thing about that is we've just watched, recently watched Doctor Who... Hand of Fear, which is when Sarah Jane Smith, the companion, leaves, and she leaves whistling. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, muddy is a very good description of the plot. Yeah. It's, it's not at all well uh, put out. It doesn't make an awful lot of sense, but never mind. No, and we get to see the Galactica in her prime, but not... Do anything. Re- not, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah which is... Dis- Set pressing, really. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like Adam with a hot shot, but maybe that is why he got on with Starbuck if he used to be hot shot. Yeah, you could you could see it that way, but the problem is that you know if we didn't like Starbuck, we're not going to like this Adam, are we? So. No, and I think you're right that he doesn't sound like Adam, and it doesn't mean the the voice, it's the speech patterns, the yeah, phraseology. There's, there's nothing about him that no. says Adam, is there? Really, no, unfortunately, no. Oh well. What did the Lama God make of this? Well then, here we are, at the end at last, or kind of at the beginning really, with Cannon and Ball. Sorry, Fish and Chips, no, sorry, uh, Blood and Chrome, yes, Blood and Chrome. And I've got to admit, I was quite surprised by this, because basically, with this being another prequel, I was expecting this to be of similar quality to the plan, let's say. Yes, I was expecting to be shy, and I was expecting to be bored for an hour and a half. And actually, I kind of enjoyed this. I mean, I'm not going to say it's the best hour and a half of TV I've ever watched, but it was a rollicking ride, it's fast-paced and fun, and yeah, I kind of didn't hate it. So, yeah, what I liked about it is that although it was 
was a prequel. It didn't get too tied up in too much continuity. We didn't get to see a lot of the Cylon story or anything or any of the other big, messy, important, epic plot details. It was just the story of young Billadama's first mission. Although we've kind of had his first mission before because that whole thing back in Razor was meant to be his one and only engagement against the Cylons. But anyway, never mind. We'll overlook that one because, yeah, this was a typically fun adventure. I mean, yeah, it was really a whole load of cliches strung together and dropped into the Battlestar Galactica universe, but it was kind of well done, so that's okay, isn't it? In fact, we have this whole rookie eager to prove himself being paired with his grizzled, cynical partner. Yeah, we've seen that before, haven't we? The whole Ice Planet gerbil thing. Yeah, I mean, I was partly actually expecting it to be a rerun of the Ice Planet Zero or whatever with the giant gun thing that they had on that two-part episode of the original Battlestar Galactica, but it went into kind of an homage of the thing instead, which was kind of unexpected, with bearded crazy survivors and flares and all of that. And even all the sections in the ski resort were being hunted down by centurions. That all felt very alien, especially the fact that when the labs, all the lights are off, there was the red lighting in one section, the blue lighting in other sections, the horror aspects of fighting the body parts. Even the Butler Centurion comes up close towards the Doctor and scans her face. That's very much reminiscent of Alien 3. So yeah, there's an awful lot of cliches there, really. There may even be some sort of reference to The Shining, given that they were in a ski lodge in the mountains in the snow, where I don't know, I haven't seen The Shining for ages, so who knows. But yeah, it was a lot of cliches, but it went along at a good pace. There was a lot of very good action on some great space battles and everything. I just enjoyed it, really. And I did like the fact that it turns out that the Doctor was a Cylon sympathiser of sorts. What with being a former employee of Raystone Industries, which we'll all know from Caprica as being the creators of the, well, of the 12 colonies, Cylons, anyway. Um, and again, we would know that if we watched the series, but anyway, yeah, I know, I know. It's not going to work on you, is it? The fact we get a bit of a Adama story with his backstory with the torn side of his family and everything, yeah, there were some details there, but they didn't overshadow the main plot such as it was or anything. What I liked about this was the Galactica. I liked seeing her again in a few more beauty shots than we kind of didn't get in the actual reimagined series because it was kind of shy of doing those sorts of things. No, I'm two minds of the redesign of the interior, really. I know that most of this was because they didn't have the standing sets. They were all based on the scans. I appreciate the fact that they were trying to make it look a bit more expansive, which, yeah, fair enough, it doesn't match with what we saw in the TV series, but this is just like with Discovery and the Enterprise, you know. Time has moved on, even between Blood and Chrome and the Galactica miniseries. Time has moved on, and possibly with a different size budget, and especially with CG set extensions, you can do more, so, yeah. CNC, possibly a little bit too big, but also more like maybe how they would have envisioned it originally. I didn't mind too much they made it a bit larger. I thought that kind of worked. Also didn't mind the fact that the hangar bay was a bit larger as well. Again, it gives it a bit of a sense of scale. I mean, it might have been too large. I'm sure there's an episode of Space Dot Jury all about this, but it kind of makes it work. It makes it feel a bit more alive, more like a bustling ship in wartime as opposed to the end-of-life Hulk that the Galactica was when we meet her in the miniseries. So, yeah, I think it mostly kind of worked. They could have done without installing all those lens flare generators, of course, but, yeah, you know, fashions change over time, don't they? So there we are. I also like those different model of centurions that we saw in the ski resort. They're more sort of hunter-killer types. It's, yeah, very brutal. Yes, the design we've not seen before, but there's no reason to suggest they didn't have different sorts of centurions, so they look kind of like a bit of a hybrid halfway house between the original Galactica-style Cylons and the Cylon centurions we get in the miniseries, so yeah, why not? And unlike with the plan, the music is also fantastic this episode. Bear Mercury is back, it's not just his stock stuff that's been re-edited and recut together to create something not entirely new. But he's got some good soundtrack bits, it's mostly the same as Galactica, but there's some good moments, and I love the very rock, very heavy end credit song. But yeah, not a bad conclusion to his work for the series, really. I guess the only couple of things that I wasn't too keen on, really, one of them was the snake in the horror movie Ice Cavern sequences set on Gerbil. Yeah, that's just not very Galactica, really. One of the things that they didn't do with Galactica was have aliens of any type, really. It is just the humans and the Cylons. So to be suddenly attacked by an alien from a horror film, it drags you out of it, really, and that's not what Galactica's about. So the explanation of where the creature came from, though, was quite good. I like that. It was another of the Cylons' experiments on their path towards creating the hybrid. The hybrid! So, yeah, I kind of like that side of things, that sort of biomechanical horror side, but it just didn't quite fit into Galactica. But, hey, you know, if they were going to go with the whole series with this, then why not expand the universe slightly? Why not? The other thing that really did throw me out of it, though, was the fact they reused so many actors. I spent a lot of the episode going, wait, do I not know these people? And these people and these people? But it can't be, because this is a prequel set many years before. And yeah, it just turns out that a lot of the bit part actors that were in the original series, or even in Caprica, the commander of the Galactica was from Caprica. And they've been using all the other series. So yeah, it just, just made it feel really weird when we were seeing other characters. So I kind of wish they hadn't done that, but eh, oh well. So yeah, it's a shame, really, that this didn't go to series, because it was fun. Although I can't help but feel that had it gone to series, then we would have ended up hitting all those continuity snags that we would have all been dreading. So yeah, it's probably for the best that it didn't. It does just end up being a one and a half hour movie about a young rookie earning his wings sort of thing, stereotype. So yeah. In all, there are certainly worse ways that this could have finished. At least we didn't end on the plan.
So, yeah, it's definitely got that going for it. So, here we are then, at the end. Thank you so much for shepherding this group of ragtag feedbackers on this years long journey for that shining beacon, which is all, well, most things Galactica, giving me an excuse to go through and watch Battlestar Galactica. When I moved into the house I'm currently in, having broken up with my previous girlfriend, I bought myself a new telly, a Blu ray player, and I picked up Battlestar Galactica cheap. The even more version that is a box set, and then never really had an excuse to watch it until you came on the podcast. So, thank you for that. I mean, yeah, admittedly, we had to watch Galactica and Galactica 80 as well, but yeah, you know what? That was fun to do as well. So, yeah, so thank you very much for this. I've had a great time re watching all these series, and it's very much appreciated. And it has been quite a journey, really, from the campus of the original series to the utter shyness of the 80s to this revisitation of Ron Moore's Galactica, which sometimes stands up to the memories that I have of the series and oftentimes falls very, very short. So, yeah, has this feeling shown Ron Moore's Galactica to be not quite the classic that I remember? Uh, unfortunately, it is. I mean, there's still an awful lot of stuff there to enjoy, and I think if I was to rewatch it again, I would definitely miss out some of the episodes I'm looking at you, boxing and flashbacks. But that aside, it is still quite a good series. It's just got a lot of flaws that I can see in hindsight now, especially you know, watching 10, 15 years later. Little things they could have fixed which would have made it better and more of a classic, but it's been fun to go along and re-examine anyway. And of course, it was something of a journey for me as well, with pregnancy watch and all. I never thought I'd be giving podcast feedback whilst my wife was in labour, but there you go. So yes, so as ever, I hope everyone's safe. I will not be feeding back on the next episodes because there aren't any, and I don't think I'll be joining you with Buck Rogers, unfortunately, but I will be joining you on the original series podcast, so I'll see you over there. So again, yes, thank you for all these podcasts, and of course, as we well know, all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. So I very much look forward to feeding back to you on all this once again in about 150,000 years or so on your podcast. Thank you, sir. It's been Thank a pleasure you. to have you along with us. Yeah. And uh, yes, look forward to travelling with you with the uh, original series Star Trek, which will be over on the uh, broadcast feed. Mm. I'm, I'm tempted to go back now and, and, work and find out which one was the one <laughs> where Joe was in labour. I don't think we heard her in the background, so... <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, in terms of looking at Galactica overall... There are definitely parts that don't stand up now, mm. but it was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, and there are some parts that still stand up yeah. really strongly now, as he said. So it's 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 an interesting rewatch from that perspective. Yeah, he liked the music that you didn't. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a taste in music thing, isn't it? So you know, yeah. some people like squally guitars. And I think you're right that the the snake thing does take you out of it because it doesn't seem to fit with the galactic when I re- universe. When does I originally it? saw it, that's what I thought, but then they do explain it by saying that actually it's an experiment from the Cylon, so it's not actually technically an alien, but it's but it's still not the sort of thing you expect in Galactica, though, is it? Uh, well, it's, it, it fits from their explanation. Mm. I think it took took me out of it a bit as well. Um, and I I saw the Terminator Cylons as being an interim model mm-hmm. between the ones that we see in the original Galactica and the, the later ones. Um, but I, I do agree that the utter shiteness of Galactica 1980. Oh, I yes. Think, I think, yeah, it, it, you can look back, I think, on the original Galactica with nostalgia. Yeah. There were some episodes that were rubbish, but mostly it was cheesy fun. Yeah. No, not I, no, <laughs> no. We we could put that in the bin. Yeah. I think quite easily. It, 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 there's a reason why that died a quick death. So. There is really yes. <laughs> anyway, the CNC uh, being larger didn't bother me so much as the fact that it just looked 100 percent less real. Yeah, um, that's the problem. Whereas if they obviously they weren't going to build a set just for a set of webby zones that weren't necessarily going to go anywhere, but um, yeah, that's your problem. Whereas now they could probably achieve that effect using that Wonder Wall thing from. A Mandalorian. And yes, reusing the actors seems really odd. Is Canada short on, on actors or something? I don't know. Oh, and Ice Planet Gerbil. Is there a Desert Planet Hamster, I wonder? <laughs> and, and an Ocean Planet Capybara or something. <laughs> what did Drew and Tracy make of this? So we just watched the last one, Blood and Crime. We did, yes. And your thoughts on that one? Um, <laughs> it cut into the chase. Oh. Okay, well, it's... It's very different in tone, wasn't it, from the the rest of the uh Well, let's just like backtrack. So this okay. was the story <laughs> of Bill Adama. Well, it's a story, isn't it? It's not the it's not, story, well, really. Is, well, it is the story, because it's how he got into um, the well, fleet. Yeah. And, and, and to be fair, when this first started, it was like, oh, like the, the, the story of Bill. And I was like, oh, yawn, this is going to be really boring. But it did get better... 
Yeah, it was okay. I, I what I would say with it is it was it was okay story, but totally different in tone and feel yeah, and everything to Battlestar sure. yeah. Galactica. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, this is one of these things. I, it looked a bit cheap, you know. It looked, it looked like the whole thing's been filmed in front of a green screen. <laughs> yeah, the okay. effects are a bit computer graphic okay, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I, I guess it's not got so much money as like the series and that lot, and it's probably just trying to pump out another kind of. Um, film. But, but yeah. my question to you: When they were in the briefing room, why are they using like VR or I know, yes, like simulators? It's, it's got a bit to discovery, kind of, isn't yeah, it? It's why the they, past, but it's more. But their technology is like advanced. Yeah, I, I, I don't didn't know. quite get that. So, doc, the Doctor Kelly, the Rebecca, yeah, there's a written all over it that she was going to be a baddie, wasn't it? Well, you know I, mean? I kind of kept the faith but like yeah when like her and Adam were going to get it on I was like she's about 40 know, and he's like as well. 18 so yeah. like he's, yeah. getting, he's punching above his weight there yes and I wasn't quite sure who she was going to turn out to be but yes she was a Cylon sympathizer yes that is exactly what I said but this is what I said to you like Cylons feel pain yeah, I, you know, she, she, just what she was saying. Yeah, I think that's because part of her, like, being on their side. But, yeah, let's just go back to it. So, the plan is very convoluted, isn't it? So, yeah. they've, they've got a ghost fleet of ships that have been destroyed and lost. Yeah. That they've secretly get in there. <laughs> and then they get her, because yeah. they're going to upload a virus. Yeah. So, got to get her to the secret base to upload it. But this actually, is... she she's a sympathiser and she's actually on the Cylon side. But no, they know that. They want her to do that. <laughs> so the Cylons think that they can attack the ghost fleet so that then they attack the bases. It's like, what, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> it's like, that, was, that was like the plan all along. Yeah. I was just like, okay, right. That sounds a bit crazy crackers. Yes, it? it was a bit crazy crackers. Yeah. So why did the control panel... Yes. Like a big penis. I don't know, I miss that. You say I'm sorry. So. I, if no one else I sees didn't that, see a penis, then I will but okay. like seek therapy. But that yep. was like a big I miss that bit. Penis. Trouble with this is, a lot of it is like, you don't really care about them. Like when it was that big thing when the Osira was destroyed, oh, there's 150 people on board. I'm like, yeah, there's a, have we only seen about five people in front yeah. of the green screen? It's like... Not too worried, to be honest. I really thought this was going to kind of like set the scene for quite a lot of like emotion for Battlestar Galactica, i.e., Adama and Lee and um, yes, Zach and all yes, that. Yes, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But he just didn't. No. And no. it kind of like just like it was like a, a Dharma on his own, like shagging some kind of Cylon sympathizer and like mm. not really getting along with his co-pilot. And it was just a bit like what. It was a bit cheesy as well, wasn't it? All like, oh, rookie and all that. I just lost a bit of interest, like, um, like throughout it, and just. I would say I I enjoyed it, but it's just totally tone and difference from Battlestar Galactica. It's an enjoyable thing on its own, but it's nothing to do with any of it. And once again, like the last one, if I never watched it again, I wouldn't be too worried. Yeah, if I watched this, I'd be like. Is this Battlestar Galactica? No, exactly. I would We'd never watch have it any like, just be like oh, to it. Yeah, yeah. No. It's, it's okay. Not bad. No, Not bad. This is rubbish. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> An hour and a half of my life I could have got back. Yes. Okay. Leave it there. Okay. See you later. Bye. 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 Yeah, I don't think I noticed the control panel penis, I'm afraid. Nor, nor did I. I don't know. This possibly says something about Tracy, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, the VR goggles, they were yeah, what, stupid, what were they? Yeah, what were they about? I wouldn't mind, but they were standing in front of a big screen, which they could have been projecting those images yeah. on. But no, they've all got to look at it through their VR goggles. Okay, I, th- I can only think that VR was just like, Becoming a thing, and it was yeah. like, ooh, it'll be futuristic if they have VR goggles. Was the Oculus and all that new at the time? Oh, dear. <laughs> but yes, the whole thing was filmed in front of a green screen, unfortunately, and it does show at times. Yeah, it does. Uh, but yes, certainly a very different tone to Battlestar Galactica. Far more Star Wars than Battlestar Galactica, really, isn't it? Yeah, but well, prequels. 
Mm, that too, but yes, I was, I was thinking more, a new hope in some ways. No, a new Dog hope. Dog fights, is... and you know, the, the older character, the young whippersnapper who's very keen, and even, as I say, at one point he refers to her as being a highness. I mean, a, blimey. Mm. They just needed a furry companion of some sort and a couple of robots to finish it off, but there we go. The Sardans would not play game on that. There we are. Right, that finishes us with the Pie Man! Hello, Args. Party here to talk about Blood and Chrome. That's Blood and Chrome, not Blood and Custard, the old uh, Strathly Passenger Transport colour scheme. Um, although I would have probably been in a different uh, film uh, with that. Now, uh, this was kind of meant to be a pilot, if I remember, for a kind of Cylon or Young Adama series. And part of the problem with that initially, and I'm going to get my bugbear right out of the way here, although in fairness it's, it's not uh, technically disproved, but... Uh, if you remember our Adama flashbacks basically showed that he didn't really get into combat shooting down Cylons until right at the end of the war, I mean literally the end and uh, and so it's kind of weird to see him here as like the young fighter jock um, now uh, it's just like I said, it's a small gripe and I'm sure the series would have just kind of gone eh, you know, because they couldn't have had a series set in the Cylon war with young Adama and have it not have him at least fly around and shoot down a few things um, it was nice to see some of the old designs. I did like all the designs actually in this. I liked uh, the spaceship designs. We saw quite a few different spaceships in this, so I definitely for lots of different spaceships this was good. And there was some really good space battle stuff. Some slightly ropey stuff in the planets, some slightly ropey CG, but I thought the space stuff was still top notch, as expected from uh, the Galactica people. Um, but the other things in this. Uh, yeah, so, I like I say, I like the designs. Um, the virtual backgrounds, and I think a lot of this was done on blue screen. Uh, it was something they were experimenting with. Indeed, it's now a proven technology now, but uh, back then, the thing, I think all the big CG backgrounds give it a feel of kind of a, a mid-90s um, kind of full motion video game. Uh, you know, it actually makes it feel a lot like Wing Commander. Um, and the other thing is because they can do a lot more with a virtual set, you know, they kind of two levels of raptors and I know they're agree their kind of uh, reasoning for that was this was Galactica and their prime and that sort of thing but it just <laughs> it, I'm, they're sadly coming off crisis point to this uh, the, the Lower Decks episode um, just made me think that with the lens flare and all the big fanciness and you know, all the sort of spiffiness that um, basically they'd they'd kind of done a movie remake for it and this actually does have a bit of a remake feel to it uh, just you know they've got a younger cast everything's nice and shiny um, you know, it's all nice and spiffy, and this almost does feel like almost a reboot. Uh, which, uh, you know, I mean, does it work for that? Uh, cast wise, I wasn't too keen on the guy playing Adama, I just didn't get on with him. Um, Coker I liked, um, and uh, yeah, I did kind of, I, I had seen it before, but it's been a long time. I don't know if it was because I knew that already that I guess that the, the woman they were transporting was a wrong one. Um, so yeah, I kind of liked some of that, but uh, but in general, um, I've got to admit that this left me a bit cold. Um, you know, if it, it just seemed a, a lot of it was kind of people slogging through snow, and you know, I mean, there were some good fight scenes in it. Uh, I didn't really like the redesign in the Cylons, you know, the big bulky hench ones. And again, part of it is that in my head, I'm already getting annoyed that it's not the the kind of classic ones that we saw in the Battlestar Galactica flashbacks. Instead, you've got kind of these kind of brutish muscle bound things and I'm not sure if they were meant to be an earlier model but eh, it just didn't look quite right I, I don't know I think they were maybe trying too hard for this and yeah um, like I say it's, it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination it was an entertaining hour and a half uh, but um, yeah it's maybe not I can see why I didn't go back to it why I didn't revisit it and uh, why I didn't pick up the DVD at the time after watching it because uh, yeah I just I, I it it's not bad. It just I didn't think it was particularly spectacular, um, and yeah, I think that that's kind of there's there's not too much to say to it. Like see, you know, the the plot is that they go to this planet, they have to fight a big snake thing, fight a lot of silence. The woman turns out to be betraying them, but then that was all a double bluff. I see, and I think they were trying to say something about the nature of heroism, but uh, but I'm not quite sure it really came through. I don't think they quite carried it off. So would it have worked as a series? Maybe. I don't know. There's a lot of improvement to make. Again, pilots are where you find out what works and what doesn't. But uh, well, I'm not too sure. I think the problem is that the series painted itself into a corner with that. To an extent, what might have been better is if you were going to do some form of prequel series to do it without Adama and maybe have him come in at the end. But uh, but I'm not too sure. So yeah, um, 
Yeah, definitely. I, I think if you're doing your full Galactica rewatch, I think you can miss out on both Blood and Chrome and the plan. I don't think either of them add too much to the story. Um, and yeah, I think you'd probably feel better just leaving it at daybreak. So, just to finish off, I'd like to say thank you. First thing to every feedbacker and uh, everyone who contributes to this podcast. I always love hearing your opinions. And uh, I think you always make me, everyone always makes me look at the Zero episodes in your way. But most importantly, thank you to both you, Peter and Anne-Marie. Um, without you, none of this would happen. We wouldn't have this fun little podcast community. And we wouldn't have been able to go on this um, slightly weird, crazy journey through both the, the, the 1970s slash 80s Battlestar Galactica and you know, indeed the Ron D. Moore series and indeed I think it got quite a few of us to do a rewatch that we've been planning for quite some time so uh, a deepest and heartfelt thank you from not only me but I, I think it's safe to say everyone out there in podcast land so say we all 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 so say the orcs so say the orcs so say the orcs. So say the orcs. So say we all. Nice bit of editing there, so well done. Thank you. That's really sweet. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It's completely disposable. It's. Yeah. I wouldn't bother watching it as part of it because, again, as Drew was saying, it's it doesn't feel of a theme. No. with the rest of it in a way that the plan at least slightly did even if it wasn't very good and not a great way of ending things no but at least it felt more Battlestar Galactica possibly just because it had so many scenes from you know, previous episodes yeah. in it whereas this is just like as I say this is like Star Wars does Battlestar Galactica it's, it's not odd. bad no no it's not bad in uh, a way it, that the plan was it, a bit it dull it doesn't really fit no it doesn't feel right oh that's not right no <laughs> and all the the CG, it really does feel them feel like them trying new things. Rather like when you go back and you watch Pertwee era Doctor Who and all their bloody <laughs> see so yes, <laughs> and you just know they really liked trying it out. But yeah. actually, it really doesn't hold up there's, and looks there's, bobbins. There's that cut, which I can't remember which Pertwee story it is where you get the CSO kitchen for no good reason. <laughs> 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 Yeah, they could build a set of a kitchen really easy, but no. Well, let's try that with CSO. It's terrible. <laughs> well, thank you for that, sir. That was very sweet. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, the journey continues for those who are, who've got a stomach and uh, an ability to track down the uh, cheesiness that is Buck Rogers. The year is 2021, and Libsyn launches the latest podcast on the Boardcast Galactica feed. In a freak mishap, Boardcast Galactica and its hosts, Peter and Anne-Marie, are blown out of their trajectory to re-emerge as Borg Rogers in the 25th century. In two weeks' time, uh, on Thursday the 15th of April, we shall be covering the pilot's Oh, Buck Rogers, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, sets sets the level of cheese pretty damn high to begin yep. with. There's a, uh, it's a a ripe amount of disco dancing in that and scamp- scantily clad women and Buck... Oh, I, yeah, strap yourselves <laughs> in, guys. It's going to be a ride. It's going to be a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to Mike from Earth2.net for providing that voiceover, by the yes. way. That's, uh, that's rather splendid. It is. We have an Easter special over on the other feed that will be hitting on Easter Day. It's our traditional uh, do a Patrick Stewart movie, which, yeah. Yeah, we're that regretting well. this. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. So it's a commentary for a very bad movie. But I'll leave you to discover that if you want to. And then, uh, yes, we are, as we mentioned before, we're covering the original series starting next week with The Cage. Ooh, it be interesting to revisit that. Wonderful. Thank you for everybody who's joined us for this journey. Yeah, thank um, you for your feedback. And hopefully, if we don't catch you next time, we'll catch you on the other feed next time, maybe. But take care. So say we orgs. So say we orgs. This is the self preservation society. This is the self preservation society. Go wash your German bench of blood rights too. Come your bonnet fair, we got a lot to do. Put on your dicky dirt and your pick and ride. Cause time's 
The music at the beginning of this podcast was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. All other music is used for illustrative purposes only, and no copyright infringement is intended. The artwork for Broadcast Galactica was created by Andy Palastides. To contact us, send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com. Contact us via Twitter at rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag broadcast. Visit our website at galactica.libsyn.com or view images relating to our cast on our Tumblr site, broadcast.tumblr.com. You can join our Facebook page. And there's also a Spotify playlist with all our playout tunes on it. Shut it down! Fire command. So say we all. So say we all. So say we all. So say the orcs. So say the orcs. So say the orcs. So say the orcs. So say we all.